Okay, excellent. Okay, hey guys, welcome to Button Adventures. Fitness, boxing, and farming goat therapy. With all the constant confusion in the mainstream media about what is a healthy lifestyle supposed to be like, our main goal here at Button Adventures is about making health fun and easy for you. I'm Coach Lita, and I have a background of Bachelor of Sciences in Nursing with experience in geriatric mental health and long-term care. My boxing career consisted of 45 amateur boxing fights, winning the Canadian Light Welterweight Golden Glove Championship of Canada in 2013, with a record of one-on-one -on -one as a professional fighter. In 2017, I was voted Fab Female Health and Wellness Entrepreneur of the Year in Greater Toronto Area. Now as a coach full-time for the last eight years and a proud goat mom of 11, yes, I said 11, Nigerian dwarf goats, I specialize in animal therapy, coaching women and people with Parkinson's, helping them find their inner athlete and move beyond perceived limitations through the sport of boxing so that they can keep up with their kids and grandkids pain-free. Welcome to the weekly goat vlog. Why goat? You may ask, well, as I grew up on a 300 acre farm and with cows and horses, there is huge and hard to maintain, kind of like the information overload in society about what is healthy and not healthy. Goat, however, is great little small lumps of turds, kind of like little rabbit turds, making it easy to clean up and fertilize your garden with. Then as a boxer with 45 amateur boxing fights, and one-on-one -on -one as a professional, when I train and visualize my success, in my mind, I was the greatest of all time. When you box to be a winner, you got to tap into this mentality. But being a GOAT does not mean you got to get in a ring and fight. It's about using the tips from this GOAT shit blog to sprinkle inspiration, motivation, and insight to use in your own life. That's my goal here with Button Adventures goat vlog to give you that digestible fertilizer to grow your own greatest of all time mindset. Today we have a special guest, Melissa Smith. She's the author of A History of Women's Boxing, the first comprehensive narrative of the sport that the Ring magazine dubbed the Bible of Women's Boxing. Melissa speaks and writes frequently about the sport and maintains positions in boxing as a founding board member of the IWBHF, say that 10 times real fast, and an elector for the IBHOF, and as a member of the Ring Women's, Rings Women's Ratings Panel. Her newest book, The Promise of Women's Boxing, about the last 10 years in the sport, will be published in June 2024. She otherwise trains at the world-renowned Gleason's Gym and writes pieces for her blog at www.girlboxing.org. A history of women's boxing is steeped deeply in the details of how far women's boxing has come from the bare-knuckle bar room circus-like brawling boxing to even the point of how some women have spent time in jail for the sport. To the modern day stories of the year 2007, where women's Olympic boxing exhibitions had to take place to showcase and show the International Olympic Committee sanctioning body that women belonged in the 2012 Olympics. Which, by the way, viewers, the 2012 Olympic women's boxing matches sold out to absolutely adoring fans. From the details of boxing in the professional to amateur ranks, Melissa, you really show the highs and lows of women's boxing in this book. I love your details and stories of how far women have come, but also you show how far we still have to go to be even close to being on an even paying, yes, paying field of men's boxing. So thank you so much for Melissa for joining us here today to discuss your book and the insight of the goat shed mentality to do what you've done over the years. Thank you. It's so delightful to be here. And I, I'm so appreciative of the opportunity to speak with you and, and I'm really thankful for your very kind words about my book. It was a labor of love and continues and, and my uh, continued involvement in this sport remains a labor of love. 
Beautiful, beautiful. Yes. And it's, um, there's, there's a lot, there's so much like, <laughs> because I, I mean, yeah. I'm not a huge history buff, but I am a huge boxing buff and like with stories with boxing. And can you let us know what and why you started this and why you continue to do what you do? Well, the what and why was, uh, can I have to take it back um, to about 2010? I, I had gone back to college in my mid 50s. Um, just to kind of close off a loop, I had never really never finished my BA. So I went back to school, got my BA and I really liked it. Um, I, and I, I ended up studying history. Because I thought if I'm going to go back, uh, I'm not going to go for something quick. I'm going to go for something I love. And history and uh, historical studies are, are very fascinating to me, always have been. And I liked it so much, I, I went for a master's degree in liberal <laughs> studies, which um, kind of gives you a cross-cut construct of of the meaning of culture. And, and you can approach it from history, from literature, from wherever you want to go. So... My lens was one of history, and I ended up doing my thesis on women's boxing. And my question was, you know, when we consider it, when we look at the very finite rules of the gender binary, how do you place women's boxing? You know, what what does it mean for a woman to box? Yeah. It, is, it in, is it acceptable or not acceptable? And what I found in doing my original thesis was that it's both. It's liminal. It's it exists kind of outside of it and inside of it, depending upon where things are culturally, which I found fascinating. That is, but super- more to the point, there was nothing written about the sport. You know, there were some some British scholars, Jennifer Hargraves for one, who had uh, and uh, Kath Woodward, who had written some really lo- had done some really lovely um, history in delving into um, certain historical figures in the sport and going back 300 years to the early 1700s for one, and also looking at some modern, uh, some pre-Olympic women who were really working so hard to break the norms to be able to fight, such as Jane Couch, who in the United Kingdom was the first woman to legalize the sport of boxing in 1998. And just parenthetically today, it was announced that she will be uh, in the class of 2024 International Boxing Hall of Fame, which is extraordinary um, and something that only began to happen in 2020. And what's nice is that Ricky Hatton, who's a British fighter, British male fighter will also be in the hall. So I, I'm assuming that half of Britain will will be going to Canastota, New York in June. As I said, that's parenthetical. But the, what intrigued me was that there was really no history. So when one studies history and when one really delves into what the meaning of history is, it's like, well, if it's not written anywhere, if there's no book, does it exist? <laughs> yeah. What is that meaning? So um, I, I got my master's and I have, was presenting a paper uh, on this issue of the gender binary and what, what, what about women's boxing. You know, it, it's a, it shows that the boundaries of gender binary is a completely, it's, a, it's mutable, it's forever changing. And I then uh, was offered an opportunity to pitch a book on the history of the sport, since I said none, none existed. And I jumped at the chance and and just dove in since I was already in a, in a, in a mindset of, of uh, research and study. Yeah. Having just completed my master's, uh, I dove in and used, a, you know, there really, as I said, there really were no books. Um, there are little articles, there are journal pieces, yeah. there are chapters in other people's work. And I just dove in and found Thankfully, a lot of source material, original source material of newspaper articles that date all the way back to the early 1700s. But yeah, well, they were so. And that cool. to me was amazing to find yeah. advertisements for boxing matches from the 1720s, literally in British newspapers. So I used that to kind of, 
as one stream to be able to tell the story. And then, you know, I found the names of fighters and traced out what their histories were and why they existed and what why they did what they did. But I also was really careful to place it within the context of popular culture within the times that I wrote about. So yeah. when I wrote about the early 1700s, I talked about the fact that it's when boxing itself as we know boxing, started to be created by a man named James Big in 1719, who created our concept of boxing. Because uh, there was always prize fighting, but it was sword fighting. You know, people fight with swords. Yeah. And then he started to have a sword in one hand and would punch somebody in the other. <laughs> right? and then then the sword dropped away and it became, you know, by the 1730s, 1740s, nobody was sword fighting anymore. It was just boxing. And rules started to evolve. And but uh, the the whole concept of boxing, which was essentially a British sport at that time, as we know it, also underwent, you know, tremendous cultural shifts um, over the course of that very long uh, 18th century, the 1700s. You know, we always think of the 19th century as the long century. Well, the 18th century was pretty long, too. Yeah. In terms of its shift and this and what was important was the shift in our construct of of the gender binary in England, uh, in, in Great Britain, because uh, by the beginning of the century, just our whole view of sexuality and what were men and women could and couldn't do was on sort of more of a continuum. Um, but by the end of the century and, and coming into the 19th century, into the Victorian era, it became very, very fixed. And um, and and a woman boxing therefore was like it even worse and an anthem than than before. So, uh, and, but boxing also had developed a very bad reputation and was pretty much shut down on the, in, in the early Victorian era. Yeah, due to corruption and other issues, and so boxing shifted to the United States was sort of on the down low as a sport. But after um, the Civil War began to gain some traction and women were right there along with it um, and fighting. And um, at the same time, the Variety Theater, which is the precursor to vaudeville, which your your uh, viewers may know what that is. Um, one of the elements of those theatrical performances were physical were exhibitions of physical prowess. Yes. So you'd have people come on the stage and they'd sword fight and they'd uh, run around the stage. Um, and there was this husband and uh, and wife who had an act where they came out and they did sword fighting. And then she ran around the stage and said, you know, she can run around the stage and do a mile, you know, within seven minutes. You know, she gets 25 pounds, you know, something ridiculous she'd run around the house and then they finished their act boxing and then she'd knock him out and he'd fall down. And this was extremely popular, played all throughout the United States and they were allegedly French. But they were, you know, I think from England. I think they were both. Anyway, they, they did their act and it gained in popularity on the circuit and by 17, 1875, it was really popular. And there was a guy, a British guy named Harry Hill, who had come over from England in the 1830s and started a bar in the, in the Bowery called Harry Hill uh, Variety Theater. Mm -hmm. and, had, and he really, after, from around you know, the 1860s, early 1870s, he started to have boxing attractions in the back as part of the theatrical stuff. And they were mostly, you know, just sort of amateur fights. But he had a ring set up and they were bare knuckle. And my supposition is that he saw the popularity of this couple, the Domers, and thought, yeah. wow, what a great idea. But right around that time, he decided he would put on a woman's, two women boxing in his bar. And generated enormous publicity. I mean, it was publicity to the point where it was in, newspapers in England that this yeah. fight had occurred. Yeah. I found that so fascinating. And, and then what they did is they, you know, they were allegedly trained and they had these two women and they, they had this fight and the winner was going to get like a silver butter dish and 
<laughs> if you know the New York press, it was literally in the New York Times, you know, in the New York Herald. It was a big deal in the press game and they had this fight. And it was very popularly received, so much so that by the early, you know, by five years later, the early 1880s, there were women coming from all over the country to come perform boxing at Harry Hill. And then those women who were really experienced were starting to go into variety theater shows that were crisscrossing the country. Yeah. To the point where, you know, by the 1880s, you had this woman named Hattie, uh, Hattie Stewart. Yeah. She was billed as the female John L. Sullivan. And John L. Sullivan was the heavyweight, bare knuckle boxer of his day, you know, the Muhammad Ali of his day. Mm -hmm. And she was billed as the female <laughs> John L. Sullivan. And she literally was one of, uh, on a, on a playing card, there was a, you know, I, I think we you've probably heard of Pops cards, which have baseball players or basketball players or famous sports yeah. figures. Anyway, yeah. the cigarette company called the Liggett Cigarette Company every year would put out these playing cards, these cards of 50 athletes or 50 famous people. That year, I think, uh, I can't quite remember the year, 18 something, mid 1800s, 1880s, there were two women. One was Hattie L. Stewart, the world female boxing champion of the world. And the other was Annie Oakley, the trick shooter and, and horseback rider. So she found herself in this extraordinary company. A female boxing performer was at the same level as Annie Oakley. Yeah. Which is kind of extraordinary if you think about it. Culture, where, where that stood in popular culture, that she would be recognized on a playing card and that it, it had crossed that boundary of uh and and there was a certain you know when you're on a playing card like that there's a certain hero worship to yeah. it you know you have this level of achievement so quite extraordinary and women boxed you know um by the 1890s Women were, you know, middle class women were in boxing classes. Right? Yeah, they were, yeah, it was like the were, way to get shape and fitness in that, which is very interesting. They, how it's parallel, exactly. They were like special gloves that were being developed for women, pneumatic gloves, these boxing gloves that you pump up with air so yeah. they could spar, but they wouldn't hurt each other. I mean, it was crazy, right? Absolutely crazy that this was popular culture, you know. But it, and it just rides those waves and it like comes crashing down and you've got people, you know, uh, ministers from the pulpit going, it's the end of society. Women yeah. are boxing. <laughs> you know? Women jailed, you know, people thrown into jail for having a fight. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's really kind of crazy. So, and that's just been the trajectory of the sport for the, for 300 years. Not yeah. a lot different. It's not yeah. a lot different right now. So you got into it, um, focusing your thesis in university and that. But did you you train out of Gleason's? But how did you you started to unravel it because you had a passion yourself for training? Yeah, I mean, I I always loved boxing since childhood. It just didn't occur to me that I could do it, you know. And then finally, in the nineteen nineties, um, I was like, oh come on. I can do this. So I started boxing in 1996 and, and went to Gleason's for the first time in January of 97. And I never left and trained myself and, and have gone through um, the experience of training and of overcoming my own physical limitation, which, you know, to the theme of your, uh, of your blog and of what being, what, what a goat is all about. Um, the thing with boxing from a personal perspective is that it's the truth. You, you have to kind of live the truth if you're going to participate in a sport like this, because if you don't, you, you get revealed really quick, really, really quickly, whether it's you get knocked out physically or, or one of a myriad of things. For me, it was, a catharsis of my own emotional traumas that I had lived through and never dealt with or had dealt with, but never in the body. And dealing with trauma in the body is the hardest thing to do 
at all. And I still, and I, I mean, I've been boxing, I've been training for over 25 years. And I only now have really understood why I never competed. Yeah. And it, and it had to do with my fear of my own anger. Yeah. That I never could quite untie that knot of um, my own physical healing in being able to understand my rage, which gets worked out in boxing. But uh, the way I work out, it's not so much the rage, it's the, it's the trauma and the drama of that trauma, which gets played out on, when I hit a bag or when I'm, when I'm training. It's all about untying those physical knots in the body. But what I, took me it just literally told this week in a conversation where I finally figured out that it was the, it's the rage that I've never really healed yet. I still have to work that through. I'm 69 years old. I still have to work that through. And where I work it out is on the back because it's, it's where I can, I can be the most honest. Is that physical release. Thank you so much for sharing that, Melissa, because it's, um, um, it's something in my own personal journey throughout the years of like childhood trauma and then being, dealing with my my son and that and his father never being in the picture it's uh, it's a very uh, as a woman it's not acceptable or hasn't been acceptable in society to be angry or to be outburst but boxing is that therapy that allows that safe place to you've just eloquently put it you know and you've also shown how it, it, it doesn't just therapy for yourself doesn't just stop it's constant it's constant work and then boxing gives you that mental physical and emotional peace to move through it and that's why I'm a firm believer and for those of us who are in boxing in the world we get it boxing saves lives and it's not just because like it's it's on so many different levels so thank you so much for articulating that and sharing that um vulnerability yeah I mean boxing as I said so many women I know in the sport and 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 as to your question as to why I do the work that I do, which is, you know, on top of, you know, just as a piece, it's a compartmentalized, compartmentalized piece of my life. Um, it's because I know that any woman who fights is also fighting herself at some level. Yeah. There's something there, her own, and and so many women that I, I know in the gym have had to overcome so much. I mean, I'm watching uh, Melissa St. B and her journey right now. She's a professional boxer. She is uh, an advocate for um, autism. I mean, just extraordinary advocate for autism and the neurodiverse and how, and the healing that's so necessary in our society. Book step these extraordinary people for who they are. So that's her, some of her work. But her work now also is in revealing her drama. Yeah. And in in doing so, not only healing herself, but offering up the concept that we are not alone. Yeah. That we all have drama, of, trauma of some sort, whether it's from within our own family dynamic that may have been terribly painful or something external that's so affected our lives that it becomes very very difficult to work through just how traumatic that experience is it could be that one a woman was a soldier or something like that uh or uh was uh, sexually assaulted in her life many many things yeah and i think we need to be kind to ourselves to acknowledge that we have these experiences and that they don't just go away. You, I, 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 I use this analogy right now. Um, I'm a caregiver for my husband who has dementia. And you know, it's a very emotional experience being a caregiver and watching someone um, decline. And, and those in your audience who uh, have Parkinson's or are 
caregivers for Parkinson's will really know this very acutely. And there's a lot of sadness and anger, it's like the range of emotion. But what I realize is I have to kind of pay as I go because I don't have a lot of time left for myself. And if I don't deal in the emotion now, I I don't want to I don't want to deal with it 20, 20 years from now when I'm pushing ninety. Really? Yeah. I want to deal now so I can be free of it and just deal. And if I'm sad, I'm sad. If I'm angry, I'm angry. If I'm whatever, if I'm happy, I'm happy. And learning how to ride the wave of of emotion so that you're present with it is I think the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. And I know I miss, I, I miss, but by having um, something like boxing available or even just if you can't get to a gym, then go for a walk or pound it out running or something. Uh, it gives you space, gives one space to to be present. And that's really the key in any emotional experience in any trauma is being present and um, at least in my own experience. And when you cover it up, it it just stays there. It doesn't go away. It's still there. Yeah, that's a really great uh, analogy and um, thought process of emotions and dealing with it and the importance of it because, I mean, we only really, they say the present is only present. And this is, I've been repeating this the last few days for some reason, let's be a theme because that's all we've got, right? Nothing is for sure guaranteed, you know, and um, nope. life experience, you realize that, right? So thank you for articulating that. So what have been your three toughest obstacles to reaching um, your goals? You know, whatever that may be, maybe if you want to touch on like getting to the end of this, you know. I think um, uh, staying out of one's own way. It's yeah. like one. um, finding time. I mean, when I wrote that book, I had my daughter, and this when I published it in 2014. I wrote it between 2012 and it took me a year, 2012 to 2013, and then it was the year of public of production. And uh, you know, my daughter was 12, <laughs> so you know, I was balancing working full time, being a mother, being a wife, writing a book. So, and I, as I said, I had already been in that mode because I had been in. in been in uh doing uh university for five years finishing my BA and then doing my master's so I was kind of in that mode but it was still difficult and um finding time to carve out for oneself is probably the biggest obstacle uh I I tell this story of me as a writer um I've been wanting to write since I was 12 years old I still haven't written it's like what does that even mean? Well, what that means is, you know, I have met constant obstacles in front of me of what that goal is. I I lived the wrong life for many years. I then I got I got married. I I started to write and then I got married and then I had a kid and then I wrote a book and then I wrote a second book and I wrote a third book all to avoid sort of the truth of the writing that I want to get to. So that's my ultimate goal, but the, I guess the the point of it is that I think we get in our own way the most yeah. to to finding our goals. And I've had a very successful life as a worker. I've had many different roles in the world of work and have had a lot of success. I've traveled the world. I mean, I've done many, many things that I feel very proud of. But uh, in terms of the work that's the most meaningful to me, it's still something to execute. I still have to get there. You know, so I got to stay alive so I can get there because I still got stuff to do, you know, got a lot to do. And, uh, you know, I've been uh, an assistant commissioner and agency chief contracting officer for the city of New York. You go, okay, what is that? I've been a project manager. I've been a, worked in IT for many, many years um, in a senior executive role. So, Lots of stuff like that, but the creative work 
is the hardest part. Getting to what is creative in oneself. And that can be career. That can be many things. But overcoming one's own obstacles, overcoming one's own self-sabotage are really the, the keys to, to what that success can look like. And that's still something I struggle with and push through. Well, thank you for sharing that. So you've had many things that you've done throughout your career, which is absolutely mm-hmm. like a life from an outside perspective of life fully well lived, which is amazing. Absolutely. Is there three highlights that you could maybe articulate um, for us about your careers? Sure. Um, you know, in the world of work, uh, uh, well, it, it, a, a few, well, a number of things. Um, I was in uh, the U.S. Peace Corps living in the, so in the former Soviet Union Wow. just after the fall. Uh, that was an extraordinary two-year experience of living in Russia, working in the Russian Far East, that's where I lived in Vladivostok in Habarsk. I, I really, it was really an extraordinary honor to be there, to live uh, with my counterparts um, at that time and to understand the struggles of the people that I was living with and, and I hope in some way assisting in terms of negotiating. I, I was there as a business volunteer and helping set up business construct that would be aligned in the sort of Western accounting and Western modes of um, doing business um, and was very involved in things transactionally. But that was a very, a, a real highlight in my life that I could do that um, and be there for that. Um, I worked for the New York City Fire Department. I was a contracting officer. And I think the biggest honor I had there was I uh, was the contracting officer for building two new fireboats that were 128 feet long. Uh, one of them was the 343 that was named for the 343 firefighters that died in the Twin Towers in 9-11. And uh, I was very instrumental in ensuring it was built appropriately. And I had the honor of christening it when it first went in the water down at the shipyards in Panama City, Florida. Wow. So that was an extraordinary highlight of my life. And I, I you know, it, it's sort of like a surprise. One does not plan on ever cracking a boat with a with a <laughs> champagne bottle. That's all I can say. It's just, it's was definitely not on my bingo card of life. And the other thing that was not on my bingo card of life was just the world of boxing and becoming a women's boxing historian and, and, and having the role of, uh, you know, being on the team that selects um, fighters to be voted on by the international boxing hall of fame in Canada, New York, or working with Sue Fox and being on, you know, a, a founding board member for the international women's boxing hall of fame. That's just such an extraordinary honor. To be um, to be among that, and to be able to give back, to be able to give to that community, yeah, and to see the joy um, on the faces of women when who really work so hard to have careers as professionals or as amateurs in the world of boxing in a, in a sport that really hated them and still hates them. Sorry, that not all this bullshit is it's bullshit. They still hate them. Yeah, not there's... particularly loved exploited everything else i mean we can go through hours on that topic but just that honor being able to do that um and and still being able to come in on the sport to to have had the honor of being able to write a second book which will take a look at what happened since the olympics and has it really you know who who who's up who who really has had the had opportunities and, and who is still struggling and fighting, you know, for any opportunity at all. Someone like Olivia Garula, you know, brilliant, brilliant boxer, champion, I don't know how many times older, but fights for eight hundred dollars a round today. Are you kidding me? So uh, try to amplify that and um be remind people that there is value and worth in the choices that women make on on the things that they do. 
beautiful. Thank you for articulating that. Um, throughout it all, have you ever wanted to quit, like going through the process of writing your books? I think when I was in the midst of the promise of women's boxing, I was ready to shoot this. I was like, <laughs> I don't want to do it. It was fine, but it's just, you know, it's exhausting to write a book. It's tiring and, you know, you you put very like the amount of detail that you put in there. Like there's some moments where I just felt like I was sitting in the 18th century in that like in the bar watching this unfold, you know, and it's like, wow, like you you could feel in a lot of parts in your book the emotion and the passion and the and the extreme detail and to making sure it's authentically each part of history is authentic in the way that you wrote it. You know, which is I can just only imagine like <laughs> exactly wanting to feel like you wanted to shoot yourself because you wanted to quit, which I'm assuming is metaphorical. <laughs> it's metaphorical, absolutely. And with this, you know, with the promise of women's boxing, it's uh, and then it was certainly the case with the and uh, with the last couple of chapters in in the history of women's boxing which I called a history because I didn't want the arrogance of ever saying it's the history. It's not the history. It's a history. I really hope there are historians out there. They're going to pick up the gauntlet and keep going and tell these stories, dissect what I wrote, find the errors. There are errors in there, amplify some of these things. But there's a, the dilemma for a historian uh, when you're writing about something contemporary is what is informing my choices? I have made choices editorially to focus on the A and not do B. Yeah. I mean, the promise of women's boxing that is really acute because it's literally the last 10 years. So who the hell am I to make these choices? But I've made them anyway. Yeah. And it's sort of like, it is my book. So these are my choices. And whether you agree with them or not, please at least give them their due. And you can be critical about it, but it's what it is. This is my view of the last 10 years of the sport. Is it everything I feel? Not necessarily, but it's a snapshot within, you know, nine chapters and 300 pages. Yeah. Um, and it's agonizing. Those choices are agonizing. Those decisions are agonizing. The approach is agonizing. Never think ever for a minute that a writer who's putting herself into her work is an agonizing over those choices of how 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 it's described, who we describe, who I describe, why I describe it, and the way I end my book is, you know, I made the choice to walk, to write about boxing sisterhood, you know, with the story of Amanda Serrano and and Heather Hardy, yeah, uh, and there are folks who may not agree with that. That's okay. I saw that as indicative of really what it's all about what the promise is all about is that we promise each other we cannot rely on promoters and all the rest they're not there no where it's there is your sister in the ring yeah that's and beautiful that's what's there to me anyway to in my perspective in writing that work i'm excited for it to come out and, and read that's um We'll, we'll definitely have to do a follow-up <laughs> yes <laughs> um so do you have a specific definition of what you consider success um, that's a good question i i uh, to me success is when one is true to oneself true and true to the objective that one is putting forth uh, for instance, when I when I worked for the city as an agency chief contracting officer for an agency called Housing Preservation and Development, I would feel success when I knew that I was doing my best and that my team was doing their best in managing the process of spending the people's money, taxes, the money that we literally pay in taxes is the money we use. To procure that I was within the rules that we've laid out and that I was meeting the needs of my clients which were my brothers and sisters in the agency yeah. to ensure that they were getting the best that they could possibly get 
to aid in doing their jobs. And it might be that it's not just pens and pencils and computers, but it may be that they're getting the right uh, kind of not-for-profit organizations to assist them in dealing with housing matters in certain neighborhoods. You know, uh, there might be you know, situations where uh, predatory uh, lenders are trying to kick people out of their homes with ridiculous mortgages. Um, how do we help prevent that? How do we find the right resources to help us in developing the criteria to prevent those kinds of practices? So even though my role is as a contracting officer, it's also to understand the needs of the client, my client, and how to go about helping them get their best bang for the buck. So that to me was success, being able to do that. And uh, so success can be, wow, I made a million dollars. That's success. I, I view it a little bit differently. I view success as having integrity in terms of what one does. That's probably the highest measure of success. Doing one's work with integrity, with honesty, with a view towards helping the other. To me, that's the most success that one can have in, a role, in the role of work. And I feel very good when I'm able to, to do that. And when I mentor people in, in the world of work, that's sort of one of the baseline, especially in the world of public government work, which I believe in very strongly, uh, is very much the, what I try to instill in my mentees is that that's the responsibility. It's your obligation. You're here because the people have put you here. Yeah. So do your best. And it permeates every aspect of my life. It permeates what I, what I do for boxing. How do I put my, how do I measure the success? It's certainly not in book sales. There's not a lot. Yeah. What, how I measure success is that in my ability to keep the stories of these women alive, to ensure that they're recognized and, and accepted for who they are, that there's a place, that they have a history that they have stories, that they know who came before them, that Clarissa Shield isn't the first boxer. She, yes, she's the first gold medal, double gold medalist in America, in, 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 in North America, in South America, in our continent. Um, but in 20 years, her story should not be lost. Yeah. Just as, uh, you know, Sue Fox shouldn't be lost as a story as a, a, in her boxing life. Or, uh, or Mary and Trumier, Lady Tiger, her story should not be lost. It's instructive. It's important. Yes. It was so all about where we are and where, where to go, right? So that's exactly, exactly. So where do you see yourself over the next few years? Like you, you made um, a little bit of a, a comment there earlier about, you know, aspiring to your, your best work and you feel like you're not quite there yet and that you hope you live long enough to get there and I may yeah. not quote it yeah I mean that's kind of my next thing is sort of okay I'm I I don't think I want I'm I'm not prepared to write another boxing book yeah. I'm kind of I think I've done as much as I can and I'm here to mentor anyone who's interested in it and do what I can to help them uh my really uh, what I want to transition to is is being um Having a mentor role with others, number one, and I think I have a lot I can do to help who want to be in the world of communication and writing and what their opportunities can be to, to be authentic in that. And writing. I really miss real writing, my writing. And my next uh, project is real writing. Is That's my next book is about me. And, and I just have to kind of tune in on where, but yeah. it will focus on things like overcoming trauma and, and being living truth. And it took me a very long time to figure out what that looked like. Mm -hmm. I'm still not always sure, you know? So that's, I kind of want to write those stories. Um, I, I come from a very interesting family. Um, my parents were, uh, radical pacifists in the late 50s and early 60s. My father then went on to become a 
a Marxist-Leninist and wrote a, 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 a ma- edited an ML paper for many years. Um, so I have an interesting perspective that I was raised in uh, yeah. uh, in this in the late fifties and sixties and seventies. So I have those things that informed my life in a lot of ways. Some of which I lived through, so, some of which I kept, some of which I jettisoned. I'm interested to tease out those stories. Some of them are really interesting. Um, teasing out having a nervous breakdown in my late 30s, uh, teasing out marrying, having a child in my late 40s. I mean, what, what, so th- there's a lot to tell. And I think a lot that can be, uh, that can be funny and witty and sad mm-hmm. and lots of joy and also offer opportunities and alternatives for how women think about themselves and their lives. I have certainly not lived a linear life. You get that totally. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. <laughs> so, what three pieces of wisdom through it, uh, it all or pieces of advice that you would like to give to the viewers to help develop that goat mindset for themselves that they can take away? Biggest is get out of your way. What are you? What are you doing in your life that's impeding your ability to live your life? That's the biggest. The second is don't cheat at solitaire. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we all do. Right? All here forever. <laughs> uh, how many? You know, you're you're living your life. Who are you kidding? <laughs> you know, don't, don't do it. Stop. Or if you do do it, no, you're cheating in solitaire. You're yeah. not playing the card right now. You are pulling out this from the deck. Own it. <laughs> Own cheating. Own cheating. <laughs> so get out of your way. Own cheating. And the third is probably the hardest thing of all is love yourself, baby. Yeah. Look in the mirror and give yourself a kiss and say, I deserve this. I yeah. deserve love. I deserve all of the good things that life has. Yeah. And yeah. that's probably the hardest is to accept that we deserve kindness and love. Yeah. And not to be beat up and not to be smacked around, whether metaphorically or physically. We deserve that. No, you You are a diamond. It's a. I literally used that metaphor last night with one of my teenage um, kids. I'm coaching, and she's she's very shy. She's very, you know. And I said, uh, and she's kind of. I forget exactly how it happened, but I said to her, you know what, like the pressure, like she did better under pressure with the thing we did in class and, and she's hesitant in other mm-hmm. ways. And I said, diamonds are made under pressure. Just remember yes. that. Like it's yeah. so important, you know, like it, it to not hesitate with pressure because that's how we're formed to be better in life. And yeah. an analogy is the diamond is like the precious stone, right? So that's it's precious for many levels, as you say, it, it, under pressure, but also its ability to cut through crap. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's women in this sport. Oh, I'm telling you, a lot of anywhere in life, sport, yeah. any job. <laughs> and then never mind. And then if you add on to that, your color, your religion, your, your political persuasion, it gets that much more, there's that much more pressure yeah. trying to, to hold you from those things of believing in yourself and knowing that you deserve goodness. You deserve what is best. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Melissa, for sharing those beautiful pieces of insight and your vulnerability and um, the many kind of historical journeys that you've been through and are going to go through and share um, in your new book, new book coming up here. Is there anywhere specifically that people can like follow along with you that you would like them to guide or? Where sure. Absolutely. Coming uh, I mean, on, on uh, my website is girlboxing.org. 
and I have links to books. I, I have a link to uh, a history of women's boxing through there. You can purchase it most easily on Amazon. I also have a book to an essay I wrote called How Boxing Uncaged Me, which is my first foray into truth, into real writing. And that's called The Difference. And there's a link to that. Um, I also have my blog. I've not been writing as much as I would have liked lately, but I will start to have more pieces. And I talk about boxing. I talk about my caregiver's journey. I talk wow. about things like 9-11 and uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday every year. So I have lots of little tidbits there. Um, I'm on social media as at Roll Boxing Now. On Twitter, it's mostly all about boxing. Um, I'm also on Instagram. And then I have a little bit of my political life on things like threads. But boxing, uh, women's boxing, outgirl boxing now, as I said, on, on uh, whatever is Twitter, I guess it's X, whatever it's called these days. And Instagram. Uh, and let's see, I'm on LinkedIn under my name, Melissa Smith. So that's it. And you, you'll see on my website, on the about page, there's links to all of that stuff. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing with us here today. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, thank you from the bottom of my heart enough. It was incredible. Uh, for those of you guys that tune in weekly or follow along next week on Thursday's uh, Go Chip blog, we're going to have Ginny McNall. I'm hoping, say, I hope I'm saying her last name correctly. She is a three-time American Ninja and the oldest um, American Ninja competitor. And just recently in 2022, I believe she was inducted into the Guinness Book of Hall of Fame for that. So some great inspiration and insights next week with her. And again, thank you so much, Melissa, for joining us here today. And if you guys found inspiration and in everything, make sure you tag and like and share this amazing, incredible interview. You have an amazing rest of your day, everyone.